Okay, let's resume. And okay. And I'm happy to present the first speaker of this uh, second session this morning. In fact, this is a session wholly Netherlands based because we got both Baron Mons who is here, and the next one is Jacques Lenison. So this was not planned, but in fact, the two of them come from the Netherlands. I mean, I've put, uh, Baron, you can start coming in because uh, I've put three affiliations for Baron because he has many affiliations. He's the co founders of two companies, Colexis and Nuco. Nuco, which has been, I mean, very generous with a sponsorship to us. And he's at the universities of Rotterdam and Leiden. And he had two lives, scientific life. I mean, you, he's trained as a cellular and molecular biologist, worked in malaria research for more than 10 years, if I remember correctly. And then, as it says here, he started to design Tesoris based concept extraction technology to make sure we did it correct. I cut and pasted <laughs> from the new code. And he has been involved in a lot of development of the system for meta analysis of scientific papers and other data resources. And this is one of the things he's going to speak about. But we, for every speaker, we have those geolinks and uh, biolinks. Of course, he has, uh, I mean, well, not of course, he has studied in uh, Leiden and he has, he's now in Rotterdam. I put Geneva between quotation marks because Baron has been coming back and forth to Geneva so many times now that basically we feel like, like he's living also in Geneva. <laughs> so, which is good. <laughs> and as links, I've not put any links on the people who really she has published in malaria research field because those of you here don't, are really not, knowledgeable about those people, but I've put uh, Eric Van Mulligan and John Kors, with whom he works a lot in, uh, on Colexis and uh, Nuco now, Christine Schissester, because uh, for those in Geneva, a lot of them know her because she used to be at GeneBio and now she works with Baron. And I put Albert. Albert Mons is Baron's brother. And uh, so I've been working together in those two companies. And from what I know, Albert makes sure that Baron doesn't make too many promises. <laughs> to deliver things and since the company cannot because make money because he wants to give everything away for free. So he's making sure that sometime <laughs> the company can do things and uh, that he doesn't give them to one. So thank you for being here. Yeah, that's the starting signal. Thank you, Amos, for your kind words. Indeed, it feels almost like living in Geneva every now and then. Uh, let me first start to confirm the three affiliations here and also explain upfront why a company would sponsor a meeting like this or be interested in giving things away. Uh, well, it's very clear. We hope with what I show today uh, to gain a lot of people and a lot of traffic there on the sites that we support and therefore uh, gain value in the company. So there is nothing secret about that. But everything I'm talking about today is open source software or open access software, so it will always be free, uh, freely available for everyone to use. And in the second half of my talk, I will mainly concentrate on what we do together with the Wikimedia Foundation, with Jimmy Wales, uh, trying to get a scientific version of the wiki environment. And of course, that is by definition also open source, open access. Um, my groups at the university are called Biosemantics. I will not go into the details why we came to that name. But what we concentrate on is basically what I now call second order semantic enrichment, as opposed to first order, which is the recognition of concepts and the disambiguation of concepts in text so that you know what you're talking about, which is, of course, very important when you want to do meta-analysis. And it's not that we do not do first order uh, semantic enrichment, like the tagging, for which we now use the Colexis technology from our previous company. But I heard already today that there are maybe even better taggers for that first order. So we are not concentrating on fact-finding like triplets that have been explicit in text. What we are looking for is loose associations. And I think Janet gave one of the best introductions I could have. What we try is to bring all this information which is in the literature but not yet in databases in a very meaningful way in connection with whatever is there. Um, we know that there is for everyone too much to read. Um, 
Therefore, we believe people go from reading to consulting. If I do my microarrays now and I have 10 genes that I've never heard of that come up, I would rather call or write to an expert immediately than reading hundreds of papers. Uh, so finding experts is very important. Uh, from reading to meta-analysis, so you want to have pre-digested information from the literature, uh, but then you have to do a lot of pre-work before you can do this. We hope to go from writing to knowledge representations, I'll say a few words of that, and then we move to central and distributed annotation. I will talk a lot about distributed annotation. We know there are technologies for that already running, but we also know they are sparsely used, and the theory is that we have to give people enormous incentives to go to these sites and do this work, not just as a service to the community, but with immediate incentives to themselves. So if you look at the basic idea, we call a paper, we, have, we, we hate paper, of course, and we say, when scientists have done experiments, they have basically semantic networks in their mind, A inhibits B. But you can write that down in many different ways, and we say writing introduces a lot of ambiguity. So you basically bury the gems that you had in your mind in, very, in text, which is a nightmare for computers. Now what computers have to do is the famous text mining, which has a very negative connotation nowadays because most people say it doesn't work, and then you get back to the same situation, if you're lucky. So why write at all? Why not uh, go and have a much more efficient way of change, exchanging information where you basically create knowledge representations based on the literature. People will never quit writing, of course, and communicate much more directly from mind to mind. Uh, that is the tagline of the new company, of course. So what, how do we do that? We first disambiguate in text and we tag and link the concepts to Sysprot, to the UMLS, uh, to Zorus, etc. But many other people do that. It's not going to be a long uh, part of my talk. We do that for a lot of content that we can access, like PubMed and so on. But we can also do it on the fly for selected web environments. Uh, so the concepts are recognized during the, the time that the page comes to your screen, so to say. We meta-analyze uh, lots of literature at the concept level, not at the word level, provide this meta-analyzed information to people, and thereby we hope to support what we call knowledge discovery on, online. Now, just a few quick words on ambiguity, which basically I don't have to explain to anyone in this room how terrible the problem is of synonyms and homonyms. Now, synonyms are relatively easy. As long as your thesaurus uh, contains them all, you will map all these synonyms to the same Swissprod number, of course, in text. That's not a big deal. However, the homonyms, are my beloved favorite one is PSA, which has 189 different meanings in Medline alone. Um, so whenever you find a tool that claims to disambiguate text first, type PSA and have a good laugh. Um, you understand that if you want to find the conceptual clouds around PSA, as in prostate-specific antigen, you don't want to include all papers on all these other PSAs that are very frequently in Medline without the long form there, because then it's easy to disambiguate. Uh, yeah, people say, but now we have nomenclature committees like uh, the Hugo and C, and they say, don't use SEP1 anymore for DEFB4, don't use SEP1 anymore for ELK4, don't use SEP1 anymore for PSAP. Now, first of all, there is the famous statement that biologists would rather share their toothbrush than their gene names. Um, so people simply keep using SAP1. But also, we have to include the old literature before somebody said, don't do it anymore. Um, so how are we solving this? Well, first of all, we recognize these concepts in text, as I told you before. And this is a part of a paper I wrote, which gene did you mean in BMC Bioinformatics? And actually, the text that you see there is part of the paper itself. And it shows you how we map, for example, TNFSF5 and CD154 to CD40 ligand, which is not in the text itself. And also EBV or human herpes virus 4 are both mapped to the same uh, concept. But that's the, the basically the easy part that many other people do now as well. Uh, then you create a fingerprint. And that is a little bit already additional information. Because what you do is you look for each of the concepts you found in the text. You look uh, with uh, inverse document frequency how specific it is in a whole Medline context. 
So you look already a little bit on that paper to the background of the whole Medline database, and that is determining the weight. So the frequency and the inverse document frequency or the specificity determines the weight of the concept. And of course, you can express this fingerprint uh, as a vector in multidimensional space. The second order semantic enrichment is something that creates the NOLET. And I will try to explain to you what that is briefly and then move to the wiki stuff. Um, how did we come to, the, uh, to that idea? Well, we said if we want to disambiguate PSA, for example, or any other homonym like BSE, is that breast self-examination or is it bovine spongiform cephalopathy or backscattered electrons? We said, okay, we take these two meanings, take an example from PSA, we collect a number of papers of which we are sure they are about that particular defined meaning of the acronym, and we take the knowledge of these, or the fingerprints, uh, you could say at this stage, of the papers, and we create what we call a reference knowledge, which is the typical defining surrounding concept clouds or neighborhood at the conceptual level. Typical concepts that are always mentioned together with this defined meaning of PSA. Um, you do that also for the other meanings, and we did that for lots of stuff. And then what you do if you see a new text coming in, and you have to index a new text. By the way, you see down, down uh, at the downside of the slide, you see the publications uh, about this. Uh, you get a PSA, no long form, you don't know what it means. You look at all the reference knowledge you have, you compare those with the knowledge of the paper in which you found the uh, acronym, and then you decide whether you deal at this particular case with psoriatic arthritis or with uh, prostate-specific antigen. And in that one paper by uh, Bob Schijvenaars, we show that uh, in the worst case scenario, when we have as real psychological masochists, we have removed all the long forms and we only took uh, ambiguous gene names, we still do 93% correct if we have minimally five Medline abstracts per gene. Of course, you need to have uh, context, that is clear. Now, then it became interesting because he said, if we can do this for ambiguous concepts, we can do it for every concept. So basically, you st start with the text, then you resolve the ambiguity, still first order, so to say, concept tagging, and then you create the knowledge of a text, then you take the multiple texts, you aggregate the knowledge that are all about one concept, a gene or a protein, and you have object knowledge. And we make those, very importantly, coming back to the consultancy part, also for people. So if I have all your papers and I accumulate the knowledge of all your papers, we have your knowledge, which is the concepts you're good at, or hope to be good at. Uh, then. We aggregate them again and we can make what we call collection knowledge, like a category, a pathway. We take all the knowledge of the proteins in a pathway and we have the pathway knowledge. And these we can all compare with vector matching. And that's what we basically do. Um, now we have built, and this is the crucial part to understand, otherwise the rest of the talk makes no sense. Uh, we have built a virtual matrix of the entire Medline database, but you could do the same for all patents or for Wikipedia, or for whatever, uh, for the same concept, actually. And you take the, uh, the knowledge, the, the papers about uh, concepts, for example, all papers of a certain person, all papers that f uh, are published by an organization, but also object knowledge, like for a gene or protein, uh, a disease, a drug, etc. So for each concept in the thesaurus, in UMLS, SysProt, whatever database you have, we can make a NOLET, which describes the context, the typical context of that particular concept. Now, the, uh, so we have already over 15 million from uh, PubMed alone, but now we go to the matrix of associative distances. And how did we do that? We took all the concepts from the thesaurus and we made a matrix, put them both there, and of course, they all have an association value of one with themselves. But uh, for example, if you want to know something about, let's say, uh, oops, I'm, this is going wrong, about the gene uh, at the bottom, don't ask the person, the yellow one, because he has very low association with that gene. He doesn't know anything about it. However, if you would find a person that has a high association, you could ask. Now, from a matrix, you can do all kinds of meta-analyses 
uh, and all kinds of visualization like uh, associative concept space that we developed ourselves, but also multidimensional scaling. And there's many other ways to now present these multidimensional networks in two-dimensional space so you can get it on your screen. Uh, I mentioned just a few here. This is one example that we published in bioinformatics where we took five groups of genes from uh, that had only one Go term associated with them. And I won't go into these. These are homonyms that we left them specifically to show that if you have the wrong papers associated, of course, they lie far out of their cluster. But the RAM2 genes were consistently placed in the uh, breast cancer cluster and that appeared to be correct upon reading. More interestingly, a paper that we are ready to, to submit now with Christine and uh, Martijn uh, Schumi in uh, Rotterdam, we hope to submit it uh, within a week to PNAS. Um, this is uh, 585, uh, 585 proteins that were annotated by Johan Coutet's group over months of hard work, and they are all present in the nucleolus. Uh, what we did, we took those, the sequences of these proteins, ran a blast, took the five most similar proteins across species, took all the fingerprints and the, the knowledge of these proteins, and then predicted function for these proteins based on the rough literature. And for some of these clusters, we reached an area under the curve, which is the accuracy of one with the manual annotation, but this takes a few minutes rather than three months. So that was nice. But the other thing is that also the discrepancies, and some of them are highlighted there in the little square. I'm not going into the details, but the paper also contains a number of defined studies. We could spend months on this figure uh, where proteins were placed in a position where the annotators were not putting them. And upon more and more reading across species, they agreed that in the cases that we have studied, the computer was right. So that's actually knowledge discovery that has never been made explicit. But it's even more interesting because we have shown now in several papers that if this system places two concepts very close together in space based on multiple dimensions, and there is no co-occurrence between those two concepts in Medline, then the chance is very high that they are indeed associated in one way or the other. So what we are planning now is the following, and this is where we go and work with Wiki. Uh, I, I met uh, Jimmy Wales in Brazil, by the way, eight, also eight months ago, and we decided to start working together on this. To do something with wikis in science, you need much better software than Wikipedia because that's flat file stuff. So we have now built a, um, a relational database, which is then operated via the wiki uh, interface. And I'll show a few screenshots of that. So the idea is the following. For, let's take a hypothetical protein A. Doesn't matter. There are multiple papers about the protein. Of these papers, we have fingerprints, and therefore we can create a nodet of that protein, the, de the red dot. If you follow the red dot, that's always the protein. And there is typical concepts around it. So the protein also ha has a position in the matrix, and it has an association with any other concept in Medline, from very low, almost zero, to one with itself. And therefore, it will end up always in concept space somewhere. But the interesting thing is now, we also have knowledge of people. So people move exactly the same way in this concept space as concepts themselves. So in other words, if in the red circle something new, because of new publications is happening, two proteins come close together that have never been mentioned together, or a gene comes closer to a disease, the people that uh, know a lot about these concepts are warned. That's the idea. Then they can go to the wiki environment, Wiktionary Z, that is the new uh, relational data model where we have already imported UMLS and Sysprot. I will show a little bit of that. And they can comment on it. So we will have a voting system, for example, uh, which is being built right now, where people can say, well, I think this association is highly likely, or this is crap. Uh, then, of course, because of those annotations, the fingerprint of the protein changes again, and it could move again in the matrix. So we are currently doing lots of studies. What are significant movements in the matrix? What is the trigger to send potential new information to people, etc.? And of course, the final approval is still Swissprop. But Amos and I have been uh, discussing a lot. That's why I'm all the time in Geneva, mainly to talk, uh, not to work. And that is um, 
is there a possibility that such a wiki layer, if it is well structured and by registration only, and we know the knowledge of all the contributors, so we know whether they are authoritative people or not, could be a pre-annotation layer for Swissprod in which the, the annotation actually getting into a solid database could be much faster. Now, how could that work? I, I made a special slide for today. Uh, it's this one. I call this the equivalent of the gas, the liquid, and the solid layer. And by coincidence, the wiki programmers that were already working on the discussion and the voting software had called it liquid threads. So that was very funny. Um, we actually pay three wiki programmers now to, to do this. And um, in the gas layer, you basically have everything that you can get out of publishers and Sysprot itself. And that's very important because it's basically a circular system. Um, the first filter is that we uh, do first order semantic enrichment. We, we don't look at words, we look at concepts. Then we do meta analysis and we have all kinds of proximity matters. So here you see all these knowledge that can freely move like molecules in a gas. Uh, and some of them, the bluish uh, movement suggestion here, some of them move today because of the new publications. Others don't move, they have not been mentioned or whatever. The, the core concepts have not, not been mentioned. In some cases, that may lead to passing a threshold where the system says, wait, although there is no co-occurrence in the entire Medline database between those two concepts, they may be related because, you know, this gene is now coming so close to this disease and you can do time analysis as well, of course, how that behaved over some time. Then we have a number of other uh, reduction filters for false positives under development. Uh, to make it very clear, this... This still needs a few months to be programmed, but all the basic technologies are there. We just have to glue them together. And then we reject a number of them, and we won't even alert people on them. Because, of course, if you have too many false positives here, people will quit. But, uh, for example, we will look, are they logical semantic types? Is it a gene and a disease? Then we look, are there first-order co-occurrences, like the Smallheiser and the Aerosmith approach, where you say A and B have not been mentioned together in the literature in the same paper or the same sentence, be indexed per sentence. Uh, but A and B have both been mentioned several times with C and with also with D. So there are first order co-occurrences and second order co-occurrences. If that all fits, then it passes the second filter and the relevant people based on their knowledge will be alerted. Then they can discuss about it and not all of them have to. If you do 50 alerts, maybe two of them take the time, uh, young angry postdocs, not uh, my professor, but uh, the young angry postdocs will probably start discussing this, and that will then confirm the chances that certain associations that we suggest from the literature are actual. And then uh, you can even do experiments, of course, if you want, and at some point when there is sufficient indication that multiple people uh, believe in this, then it is alerted to, for example, Swissprot, and it could be solid, uh, established information in a database. So it's basically a feed of the solid uh, databases. And I would hap happily invite all of the databases that I saw on the posters to do the f something that I will show in the following few uh, slides, which are basically the screenshots. Uh, well, let's first get rid of this one, <laughs> sorry. Um, Wikipedia should stay, according to uh, Jimmy Wales, neutral point of view, really only encyclopedic information. So he doesn't want first uh, science and uh, primary publications in there. Then we have started Dictionary Z, which is now officially uh, going to be hosted also by the Wikimedia Foundation, um, where this is basically the thesaurus. So the concept, identifier, the uh, synonyms, the uh, definition, but very minimal information. Then you have wiki authors, where you can go and say, well, these are my papers. We create your knowledge and then you deal with the system. And then we have the so-called science wikis, uh, which wiki proteins will be one of them, which is already up and running in a way, but with Peter Murray Rust, that, who was also mentioned by Janet, we will set up uh, wiki chemicals with all the support tools that he has. Um, and then uh, NSF is very, in, in the US is very interested in funding that. And then we connect all these, so any concept in Wikipedia will be linked to Wiktionary Z and then to authors and so on. So I took an example that I also had in the screenshots that I will show in a second. Uh, let's take the dystrophine gene in humans. 
So in Wiktionary Z, there is the minimal record, minimal essential information. One of the wiki authors is Johan den Dunne in Leiden. Um, there is a lot of information about uh, DMD in wiki proteins or any other information. And of course, as already today, there is a record in Wikipedia on uh, Duchenne. And we link all those so that we can move seamlessly from one environment to the other. This is uh, the, my last few slides, uh, Mrs. Chairman. Uh, this is a, a screenshot of something I got two days ago where the wiki developers have delivered the first version of uh, Wiktionary Z. So this is all relational database, all the fields, not flat file, fed with SwissProt. This, these are the data from SwissProt on DMD, the DMD human, as you can see. And this is all editable. So anyone that is registered can go there and add information, change the definition, whatever. I will show a little bit of that. So what we will do uh, is for each concept in Wiktionary Z, there will be a NOLET. So you can click on that and you can get all kinds of free support, such as the original source, in this case Swissprot, the Wiktionary Z definition, related concepts, experts, more about vote, Wikipedia article, browse through the knowledge browser you can jump from one concept to the other in the concept space etc and it's also very good for disambiguation this is still in the works by the way so wiki proteins is up our technology is existing but we have to integrate everything in the next few months uh, this is how you can edit as you see now i clicked on the edit button you can change everything you want and save it as long as you are registered uh, you see my name here um, then I went to the, for, as an example, to the Leiden uh, dystrophy database and I added a number of uh, indications and then you see the history here that I've changed all this and um, you can always backtrack to a previous version as a guardian if you don't like it. So I want like, well, would like to uh, show one more screenshot and then I'm done. And that is that uh, we have, during the feed of SwissProt, we have looked at the term level. So every individual term that exists gets its own page in Wiktionary Z. Now here you see the uh, a synonym of a gene, C7. And in Swissprot, as far as we have incorporated it today, this gene links, th this term links to three different defined meanings, in this case, proteins. And therefore it is also sort of an automatic homonym detection. And now people can go to their favorite protein and say, okay, this C7, the gene that produces this protein, has this context, make a note by clicking a number of papers about it, and we will disambiguate the different C7s in the next round of indexing. Um, that is basically what I wanted to show, and I would like to end by saying that we expect to get fully online with this stuff, with the semantic support by the end of the year, but Wikiproteins is already online, I can show it to people if you want. And what we are looking for is a number of highly critical alpha testers to say that things are illogical or we have to do it differently. So if you want to become an alpha tester, drop your business card with me or send me an email. I'm in the list and then we will send you the uh, URL and the way to log in as soon as we are ready for alpha testing. So uh, please let us know whether you're interested to, uh, to do that. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Yes, Unleash is first, I think, but, okay, but. Uh, Bowen, um, I just want to have uh, some explanation about the construction of your knowledge. Uh, how many documents do you have to, um, to, to, to cure yeah, about uh, this concept to have a uh, knowledge that is that gather no much, not too much uh, false positive after, afterwards. In fact, um, as I said, if you want to do real good disambiguation of genes, you need five Medline abstracts per gene to reach the 93%. But um, essentially, if you have one article about a concept, the list of concepts from that article when we go to the Medline uh, matrix, we can already construct the distances between those concepts and how they relate to each other. So already then you would see 
that if a concept is mentioned in, in context with a newly discovered gene or so, which has a high stress because it doesn't belong there, we will alert people and say this is either wrong or new because this concept is mentioned in a new context. So essentially one article is enough to create a minimal knowledge, but it will be richer and stronger and better the more uh, articles you have about the concept. Michael. Yeah. What, what, what will be the carrot and what will be the stick to get people to actually do this? I mean, uh, Amos may well pay people to do it, um, but he won't pay very many people to do it. And how do you get people actually to come in and do this? Well, first of all, the, uh, it is, of course, amazing to most people, at least to me, how immensely easy it is, appears to be to get people to contribute massively to Wikipedia. And I asked Jimmy, are these typical early retired people that have plenty of time? This is different from very busy scientists. And that's not true. There are very strong professionals spending a lot of time on Wikipedia at the moment. I was reading the records on junk DNA uh, yesterday night, and it was not bad at all. So the, um, I think that, first of all, people are getting into the mood to do these kind of things more than five years ago or even two years ago. That's one. But secondly, I think the major incentive, let's first take the carrot, that is knowledge tracking and discovery. If I go to wiki authors and there are two proteins high up in my fingerprint because of my papers, then I can become a guardian and I get a lot of support in the sense that if a disease moves closer to my protein, I get an alert even if I don't read the paper. Um, basically for all the proteins that I have clicked, uh, the system will automatically warn me when there is something to be read and not when it's obvious, but when it's new. So that is already, in my view, quite a big incentive to keep track of, of newness. And the stick, of course, which is combined with a carrot, maybe a big carrot to, to slam people with, uh, we are talking to NIH and the Wellcome Trust and others who are very positive about this, NSF, and I have been pushing like crazy for many years in the science management level that we have to get away from the horrible impact factor as the only way to look at scientific performance. So more and more, the funding agencies are very seriously considering to award contributions to wiki environments and SwissProt and those kind of very important databases. And I could imagine that in five years from now, if you are a guardian of five proteins and we want to work do this very closely with adopt the protein to test it, that will really give you a lot of status, I hope. So we, we hope to get millions of people to do that. But we will test it. I'm afraid we only have time for one more question. I would like to ask, uh, do you have any plans to include information from large-scale experiments, like microarray analysis, which are Qualitative, quantitative. Yes. Uh, well, we are working on that in Leiden. We have just uh, a few Russian students wrote import scripts from Geo and so on. Um, and we are also working with uh, Brunel University to get uh, patterns in co-expression patterns in the Geo database and in all kinds of other uh, microarray databases. Uh, we, we test this again in the environment of DMD. Uh, we have downloaded all experiments ever done on muscular dystrophies, as far as we could get them, and we have a lot of them in Leiden. And uh, now we are looking with this technology. We first create on the gross list of 1,700 genes that have been doing anything in any of these experiments, functional clusters based on knowledge. And then we look whether we find those functional clusters back in the experiments rather than looking per gene, because we know the correlation at the gene level is very low. So what we want to include later on is when you click on, you build a hypothesis checker, you say, I think I, these two genes may have something in, to, to do with each other. It will not only look at the literature, but it will only also look at co-expression patterns in uh, multiple uh, experiments, and then look to the metadata of those experiments to see whether your hypothesis makes sense or not. So we definitely want to include that. If you have any ideas, please let me know. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.